a long time member or first time visitor. We are so glad that you are here in worship this morning. My name is Christine Aragon Bruce. I'm the associate pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. Troy Hauser Bryden, our head of staff, is on vacation this week. So thank you to Maddie Lambert, our amazing youth director, for being here in worship and helping in leadership of that, and to Maria Sumner for being our guest pianist this morning. Just wanted to highlight a few things that are happening in the life of our church. Um, but for, first of all, if those of you who are sitting in the center aisles could please pass the friendship pads, that would be great. Uh, that way we can greet one another by name this morning. And those of you who are online, if you could sign the virtual friendship pad, that would be wonderful, just so we know how to uh, remain contact with you. And for those of you who are visiting this morning, please stop by the welcome desk that's in the gathering area. There's a friendly face there to greet you, answer any questions you might have about the life of the church, and there's also a little gift bag for you to take home as well. Friday, November 19th, we participate in what's called Feeding America. This is a food truck that goes around um, various neighborhoods. We're looking for volunteers. If you're available that morning, please meet at St. Pat's parking lot to, to help distribute food to our neighbors in need. This Friday night, kids and families, you are welcome to come and create your own nativity set. That's this Friday night from 6 to 7. Come hear the Christmas story, make your own nativity, and share a snack. Now we know that COVID cases are on the rise, so if you could please wear a mask to this event, that would be much appreciated. If you would rather participate via Zoom, there is an option for that as well. Uh, but we ask that you would please RSVP to our children's ministry director, Laura Burns, who will be at the family ministries desk that's also located in the gathering area. And also a big thank you to all of those who helped make this event happen. Next Sunday, we are having our congregational meeting to elect our deacons and elders. That takes place right after the nine o'clock service. If you would like to know who our next class of deacons and elders are, there's a bio sheet available in the office. So again, that happens right after the nine o'clock service at 10 a.m. here next Sunday. Uh, there isn't a slide for this, but for any of our fifth graders that are wanting to participate in your worship class, that has been postponed because we've got a lot of kids that are sick um, this weekend and a lot of leaders who are out as well. So stay tuned for an email communication from Tommy Langjans about when that class will happen. As many of you know, uh, this past Thursday was Veterans Day, so it's our custom here at First Pres on the Sunday after Veterans Day to ask any of our men and women who have served to please stand so that we can recognize you. So if any of our veterans are present, please stand so that we can applaud you and say thank you. Thank you for your service. You are a blessing to this country. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to worship this morning. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Day is a breaking in my soul.
stars are rising, bright morning stars are rising, bright morning stars are rising. was beautiful. <laughs> um, if you are joining us from home, I would invite you to get out a candle and something to light it with so that you can join us in our weekly ritual of lighting a candle together. I, I don't think I'm alone in what I'm about to say. I have been really afraid lately. Really afraid because the world feels really dark right now. And in the dark, things are not as surely known. There are questions that I don't have answers to. There are stumbling blocks in my path that I can't see before I've already fallen over them. We have been shrouded in darkness and unknowns for quite some time together. Each week when we light this candle, we're intentionally reorienting ourselves back into the light of the triune God, the light that has never stopped shining even when things feel really dark. It's a light that is so bright, there is no darkness that can overcome it. And in the light, the love of God is surely known. The questions that God wants us to have answers to are revealed. And we are bound together, surely, in its glow. This morning, in the sanctuary and beyond it, May the light of God shine for you, for the people you encounter, and may you know that you are surely loved and safe in its glow. Amen. Please rise if you are able for our call to worship. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us.
I had a coffee with a friend last week, and we had a super fun conversation about sin. <laughs> and my friend fairly wondered out loud if we're really all sinners all the time. Because surely, somebody who commits murder must be more of a sinner than those of us who are mean to our friends. And socially, I would say that that's right. Murdering is absolutely deemed to be a little bit worse of a sin in our social circles. Sin, however, is not just a list of deeds from most bad to a little less bad that we do. Sin is the temptation that is in all of us to be twisted away from God. And because we're twisted away from God, we do things that are really, really bad, or maybe a little less bad, and all of those things are just as bad in the eyes of God. But there's good news. One of the first steps we can t take to untwist ourselves and turn our whole selves back towards God is by praying and confessing out loud the things that we've done when we are twisted. So this morning, we take that first step together and praying out loud our prayer of confession. Please pray with me. O oh God of forgiveness, we pray for new life as we confess our old ways. We hear of your promise amid our own selves of self-doubt. Hope is proclaimed, yet we seek guarantees. Christ calls us to obedience, but we set conditions. When called on to follow, we ask to what end. We applaud commitment but we treasure our comfort. Forgive our reluctance to live life that is rooted in Jesus Christ. Amen. Church family, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are seen, surely known, loved, and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'd like to invite any of our kids to come forward to join me for the children's message. And for those of you joining us online, I wish we could be together, but I'm glad we're together, even if it's virtually. Hi, guys. How's it going? Good. Hi, Zachary. Do you guys like getting mail? I do, too. Because in this day and age, we tend to communicate through texts or messages through Facebook. So it's really special when you get an actual letter in the mail, right? Did you know that most of the New Testament is made up of letters? Letter, and most of those letters were written by the Apostle Paul. And we're gonna talk about one of those letters today in church. It was a letter that Paul wrote to the early Christians, early church in Colossa. So here's a little, I mean, this isn't the actual letter written from Paul, otherwise that'd be pretty special, but it's a summary of what Paul said in his letter. And I was wondering if uh, someone would like to help me read this letter. Okay, come on up, Harper. 
Guess what? I even have a mic for you. <laughs> All right. Just go. Can you read that? Oh, your finger's in the way. It says, just okay. go ahead. Just go ahead with what you've been giving you revealed. Tr tr trust ju Jesus. Jesus. The master. the master. Now live in him. You are deeply rooted in him. You are well. That's a big word. Constructed. Constructed. <laughs> up <gasps> upon yeah. him. Good job. You know your way around the fed. Yep. Now yep. do what you've been taught. Good job. School out quit. To studying. studying and subjects and starting living it and let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Okay, and now what's that last part? Love, Paul. <laughs> Good job. Well done, Arthur. Good job. <laughs> so if we could summarize Paul's letter. Basically what he's saying is church, and he's actually saying this message to us too. Well, God's speaking through Paul this, this message. Through Paul, God is saying to us, hey, you know who Jesus Christ is, and now start living life through him. Keep learning about who Jesus is because faith is an ongoing journey. It's not a one-time deal. And what's really great about that is Jesus helps us every step of the way in our faith journey. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who shows us just how much you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Now let's stand together, and we'll say our blessing to the congregation, and they'll say their blessing to us. So may God be with you as you worship and learn together. And may God be with you as you worship here. Go in peace. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Zach. We've brought back the passing of the peace, uh, but we want everyone to feel comfortable about what that looks like. So feel free to wave the peace of Christ to one another, maybe a fist bump or an elbow bump. So let's greet one another this morning. Peace of Christ. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Peace of Christ. <laughs> peace of Christ. Hi, peace of Christ. This is so ridiculous. Good morning, Lynn. Peace of Christ, Mary Lynn. I know I love this too. Peace of I'm breaking up a party, <sighs> but it's for something good. Let us all pray together again. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word that we're about to receive, and may our whole selves, mind, ears, hearts, and bodies be in tune with whatever you wish us to know and hear this morning. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to turn towards our first scripture reading, which comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to use one of our pew Bibles, and I will even give you the page number so you don't have to frantically search. It, um, our first scripture reading can be found on page 482 in the pew Bible. Hear these words this morning from the book that we love. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, 
who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. The word of the Lord. Our New Testament passage this morning comes from Colossians and can be found on page 957 in your pew Bible. Hear God's word for you, for me, and for all of us. For I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of the most enduring stories in literature and film are about finding lost treasure. Think Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, or films like Raiders of the Lost Ark or Pirates of the Caribbean, or my personal favorite, The Goonies. If you haven't seen Goonies, or it's been decades since you've seen Goonies, I would encourage you to watch it over Thanksgiving break. It's such a good movie. For those of you that need a bit of a refresher or haven't seen the movie, I'm not going to give anything away, but here's the summary. So the Goonies are about this group of kids who call themselves the Goonies, and they've named themselves after their neighborhood called the Goondocks, which is in beautiful Astoria, Oregon. But their neighborhood is about to be demolished because the local country club wants to expand. But then one of the kids, Mike Walsh, happens upon a map that leads to lost treasure. And Mike convinces the other kids that if they find that lost treasure, their families can buy their homes, save their homes from foreclosure, and they can save their neighborhood. The treasure is the answer to their problems. In Colossians, Paul doesn't mention maps or pirates, but he does mention treasure. He refers to the treasure that is Jesus Christ, that Paul describes in whom the treasure of wisdom and knowledge of God can be found. And when Paul says that he wants their hearts to be encouraged by this knowledge, this wisdom and knowledge that is God himself, he wants people to be encouraged by this knowledge in their very hearts. Now, with our modern eyes and ears, we think, oh, Paul wants them to just feel really good about knowing God, which is part of what Paul is saying, yes. But what Paul is really saying is, no, I want you to know Christ to the point that the deepest part of who you are 
is permeated by knowing Christ. That our knowledge of Christ is so deep and so profound that the rest of our personality is affected. That knowing Christ affects our actions, our words, and even our thoughts. Because in Jesus Christ, God has revealed everything we need to know about what it means to have a relationship with God. In Jesus, we see that God can be trusted. In Jesus, we see that God is faithful. In Jesus, we see that God promised that a Messiah would come, and the Messiah came as Jesus. In Jesus, we see that God is merciful and how Jesus was merciful to all people from all walks of life. For Paul, to know that is to know Jesus, is to experience that the riches of assured understanding of who God is. Because in Jesus Christ, we know that our relationship with God is secure. Going back to the film, The Goonies, the treasure was important. But the treasure led to the reassurance that the kids were all craving and that the kids needed. They needed assurance that their neighborhood would be secured because it was their life. Like so much of their friendships were formed about living on the same street. So yes, the treasure was important, but they wanted the security of knowing that basically their community would be saved. Similarly, in Jesus Christ, we know that our relationship with God is secure. No matter how far we might have strayed, no matter how shaky our faith may seem due to circumstances far beyond our control, we know that if we want to find our way back to God, Jesus is our way back to God. Which is why biblical scholar N.T. Wright says this, that Jesus is not only the treasure, but that Jesus himself is also the map. To quote Paul from earlier in Colossians in chapter 1, for in him, that would be Jesus, in, for in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. As Jesus Christ, God reconciles us to himself. We see the lengths God will go for us, seen in what Jesus did on the cross. And the full power of God can be seen in the resurrection of Christ. Not even death can keep us from God. Through Christ and because of what he did, we can always find our way back to God. Or to quote another passage of scripture from John, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If we want to find our way back to God, we look to Jesus. If we want to see who God is, we look to Jesus. Jesus is the way to God and is himself God, which is why N.T. Wright says that Jesus is both the treasure and the map. In stories about lost treasures, there's always the map, but the map is always really hard to read, right? Like parts of it are missing or it's a language that the characters can't understand. If the map was easy to read, it would be a much shorter story but that doesn't make for a very good story. But thank goodness, that's not the case with Jesus Christ. God has made it clear to us what he wants us to know about him is found in Christ. But for the early church in Colossae, that was easier said than done. They were in a very different context, right? 
It wasn't like here in Grand Haven or Tri-Cities area or even West Michigan where there is a church on every corner. In Colossa, to be a Christian was uh, to be in the minority. They were surrounded by pagan religions that were much more popular and therefore much more acceptable. The Roman emperor himself was a god. You had specific gods whose job it was to guard and protect the city of Colossa. So it seemed pretty strange to the majority of Colossians that anyone would pick a peasant Jewish carpenter who died a criminal's death to be God of the universe. It didn't make much sense. It still doesn't. But this is why Paul warns the Colossians against any sort of false teaching. The other religions were all about prosperity and comfort and protection, and those things were not guaranteed to the early church. In fact, to be a follower of Christ was to invite persecution. I think we can say, too, that comfort and prosperity still isn't guaranteed, because it never was. But the treasure that we do have is that no matter what we are disappointed with, we can rely and know the faithfulness of God with us. Again, if it's due to our own bad choices or if it's due to circumstances that were beyond our control, we have faith in knowing that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that God's love is just as steady when things were good and it was easier to be happy as God is when there is great loss or darkness or uncertainty. It's also why Paul encourages the Colossians and why we need to be encouraged to remain rooted in Christ, to keep building upon the faith that we've already received. As I told the kids earlier, being a Christian is an ongoing process. Do we have a better sense of who God is today than he was yesterday? Are we continuing to get to know God better by being in God's word, through prayer, through being in Christ-centered community, and being in worship together? When we first moved into our house, we got a knock on the door from one of our neighbors who said, I really wish I had muffins to give you, but instead I need to tell you that one of your oak trees is dead. <laughs> oh, okay. So, maybe you all have experienced this. Uh, there's this thing called oak wilt, and it is just has decimated plenty of oak trees in our area. And one of our 65-foot-tall oak trees was not spared. So we had to call an arborist to come in and inject the healthy trees with medicine in case they were infected. And they also had to build a trench around the infected tree to make sure that the roots of the infected tree weren't interwining and therefore infecting the healthy oak trees. And I wish I had a picture of what that root system looked like when that trench was dug around our oak tree, but I did find a picture online. You'll see those are roots of all just one oak tree. And it's massive. And it's long. A root system of an oak tree can go as far as 90 feet from the tree itself. I mean, that root system is taller than the tree itself. And it's a reminder of what needs to happen below the surface, affecting what we can see above the ground. 
When we are rooted in Christ, we remain standing tall and firm because it's Christ, not ourselves, that holds us steady. We still may be tossed and fro in the midst of really bad storms. Our leaves may fall off. But if we are rooted in Christ, we will have a foundation like an oak tree's, a foundation, a root system that extends far beyond ourselves. And we need that reassurance more than ever. Just maybe when we thought life was looking a bit normal, we're reminded that it's anything but. Just this week, a family shared that they had 10 calls between their three kids that they had been in close contact with someone who was positive for COVID. And I thought it was bad with our family with just six calls between the two kids. We're still grieving those we've lost. We're still grieving what life was. We're still grieving normalcy. There's hope on the horizon, but it's still hard. And we've been on the roller coaster, right, of emotions. The vaccines are ready for adults, yay, but then there's this Delta variant. But the vaccines are ready for kids, but the cases in schools are the worst than ever. Someone please get me off this roller coaster of emotional whiplash. <laughs> but it's out of our control. We ourselves can't be the roots that keep ourselves from falling in the midst of the storm or suffering from emotional whiplash, whatever roller coaster we find ourselves on. But if we remain rooted in Christ, we have the assurance that God has us even when we feel like God doesn't. And it's why Paul refers to Jesus Christ as a treasure, but a treasure that we don't have to worry about finding because he has already found us. And when we've lost our way, whether it's due to our own choices or circumstances beyond our control, he himself is the way back. And the more we know this for ourselves, the more we realize just how important it is to remain rooted and secure in him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.
You may be seated. Before we turn towards God in prayer once again this morning, we, with heavy and compassionate hearts, wanted to let you, our church family, know that Dorothy Julie, mother of De- Jeff Julie, died last week, Tuesday. Her funeral will be at Claussen Funeral Home at 11 a.m. on November 15th, which is tomorrow. And we hope that you'll join us in prayer for the entire Julie family. So let us pray together. Triune God of love, we are tired. Our bodies ache. Our souls feel heavy with the weight of things we've carried with us this past week. It seems like the whole world is burning. We've forgotten that this world is yours, not ours. That it is your spirit that empowers us to serve, to love, and to heal. That we are lights because your light shines through us. Help us to cling to that truth. May our souls feel less heavy and our joints less achy as we allow you to lift the loads we've taken on from our shoulders. May we remember that in all that we do, you, not us, are God. We sit in the uncomfortable tension with your children who are longing and waiting, waiting for a steady source of income, waiting for test results, waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for someone to step up and fill an empty staff position, waiting for the perfect solution to a difficult problem. May we be patient in this time of waiting and longing and turn towards the beautiful truth that we don't have to wait for your presence. We praise you for sitting in the tension with us and trust that you will reveal all that we need to know according to your timing. May our hearts and ears be tuned fully towards you when that time comes. This morning, we take special care to thank you for our veterans. Thank you for the time they sacrificed away from family, from friends, and from comforts of being home so that we could be safe in our homes. For our veterans that survived their service but are suffering from physical pains or the after effects of trauma, we ask that you continue to surround them with your presence. Empower us to turn towards them with a posture of thankfulness and compassion as they heal from and reflect on their time spent in service for this country. We thank you also for the men and women who are currently protecting and serving us. May they be well loved and cared for in their sacrifices. All of us are feeling the physical and mental effects of trauma born out of all of our experiences during this time in pandemic. May we turn towards ourselves with the very same compassion and grace that we are called to turn towards others with. Heal our hearts and bodies, O God. May we love ourselves and one another as Jesus loves us. We lift into your care this morning Jeff, Kelly, Anna, Brittany, and Jamie as they mourn the loss of Jeff's mom, Dorothy. May they give themselves permission to grieve as they need, equip us as their church family to love them well as they adjust to life without Dorothy on earth, and we praise you for the life that she lived. We also ask that you receive this morning the names Alice, Brian, Joan, Earl, Larry, Carolyn, Jean, Norm, and Lisa from our hearts this morning. And for all prayers that remain unspoken from our mouths, but are ever present in our hearts, may they be known to you. We know that you, O Lord, celebrate diversity of thought, appearance, and culture. You bring us together even when things feel permanently divided. Join us together now in voice and body as we pray the words that your son Jesus taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before our ushers come forward with the offering, I just wanted to give you an update on where we are with our generosity campaign. 
Um, as you can see, we are 53% of the way there. We've had 174 pledges received um, out of 372 households, so this is great news. Um, and it goes without saying to, uh, to thank you all again for your generosity um, because without you, without your time, without your gift of your finances, we couldn't do what we have been called to do. So let's continue our worship this morning uh, by giving what we can to participate in what God is already doing in our midst. Pray with me. Lord, for these gifts and the many gifts which you bestow upon us, we give you thanks. And as you entrust these into our hands, may whatever we do be firmly rooted in your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we go from this place in whatever direction you wish for us to go. We pray all these things in your Son, Jesus' holy name. Amen.
church family, as we live our lives this coming week, what has God called us to do? We are called to celebrate God's grace as a Christ-centered community of acceptance, growing in faith and living as Christ's hand to serve. So as I was working on this sermon, I was reminded that Colossians is only four chapters long. You could read it in 20 minutes. And I do, I encourage you to read it, but read it as a letter written to you, because it is. To be reminded that through Jesus Christ, God has us, even if it feels like God doesn't. But thank goodness, how God is and how God works isn't dependent on how we feel, because God has already chosen and continues to choose to be for us, to be with us, to love us. Receive the benediction. Go from this place knowing that Christ goes before you, is with you, and will never leave or forsake you. And all God's children said, amen. <laughs>